let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. You know, when I hear somebody's from Steubenville <coughs> that they've studied here, I know that they have the kind of basic grounding that they need to confront the issues, the questions uh, that are so troubling and uh, so dangerous in our culture, in our society today. And uh, to actually come now to the epicenter of all that is a, is a real joy. And I am especially glad uh, that the Center for Leadership has begun. Uh, this is the first semester uh, in which it has begun because I think this is going to intensify that kind of leadership. Um, your work, even though you're, you're dealing with cerebral ideas now, and uh, I know you have to be asking yourself the question, what has this got to do with the real world? As we say in Italian, pian piano, just little by little, step by step, floor by floor, you'll see, as it's all put together, it's going to give you this kind of foundation to understand clearly the issues that confront you, whether it has to do with family life, whether it has to do with business life, whether it has to do with developing political or policy ideas for a just society. Little by little, you'll, you'll begin to see that. And so I think uh, especially to be associated with the Center for Leadership is um, uh, a real honor for me. Now, I've taken as my topic Catholic social teaching, and this is an admittedly immense topic. It's very complex, and to be frank, uh, even those who should know what it is don't very often seem to know what it is. Uh, it's certainly in a lot of the current contemporary political debates that go on in Washington, D.C. You would have to just be a person who doesn't pay any attention to the news media to not realize the critical role that Catholic social teaching had to play, for instance, in the whole debate over uh, health care in this country. How it comes to bear on questions of foreign policy, of war and peace. How it comes to bear on questions of welfare reform policy. Of course, the whole question of life. All of these have to do with the church's view of itself and view of its role in the world and what it has to do with developing, developing a society itself. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is just focus on some very basic elements of Catholic social teaching so that uh, in doing that we can grasp a broader view of the whole. Uh, and I will address why there is a social teaching, what the roots of the church's social teaching. That in itself would take like a week worth of classes. I'm going to do that in 10 minutes. Uh, and after all, you can imagine a religion without a social teaching, right? A religion that was just meditative. We call it in theology quietistic. That was just about me and God and forget about everybody else. So you can imagine a religion without a social teaching. Catholicism isn't that religion. It has a social dimension for reasons I'll try and explain. The roots of this whole thing in Judeo-Christian uh, anthropology, what we might call personalism. And then what I'd like to do is outline what is meant by uh, the, the, uh, the role of the church and the role of the church's ideas and assumptions in history, in that it built universal charity, that the church's anthropology built the concept, that is the view of the church with regard to the human person, builds a society that is charitable and universal and institutional in its charitable outreach. So let me just kind of begin with the roots of Catholic social teaching. If I were to ask, when does Catholic social teaching begin? Most people, at least people who have read a little bit about the subject, would say, oh, Rerum Navarum 1891. That was an encyclical written right in the midst of the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 19th century. And that would be a good try. 
But really the church's social teaching go back to the book of Genesis. It goes back to an understanding of the creation of the world as a result of the generous, benevolent act of a good God who makes a physical world. Let's keep that in mind too. That the physical world is created good, fashioned by the hand of God, and then right on the first page of the Bible we read of the creation of the human person, the human family. And you find in that creation story that man and woman are formed from the dust of the earth into whom is breathed the breath of life. Remember, God forms man out of the dust of the earth, and then, so the physical, corporeal reality is real, but also this transcendent reality, that the breath of life is breathed into him. And these are two things that human beings are simultaneously, physical and transcendent. There's another two things that human beings are simultaneously. We are individual, in a sense we are autonomous. From the first moment of our conception, we are physiologically distinct from our mothers. We exist within our mother's womb, but we are not part of our mother's body. We exist within our mother's body. We are own are our own genetic composition. And yet, from that first moment of our conception, we are in relationship to our mother. So there's another two things we are simultaneously. We are autonomous and yet social. We are individual and yet social. And the whole of our existence, even outside the womb, is a kind of playing out of that tension between our individuality and the social dimension of who we are. So physical and spiritual, individual and social. What we have there is the kind of core of Christian anthropology, the view of the human person. So that any kind of social construct that the church or the institutions that the church would inspire must be predicated on that understanding of who human beings are. As I said, you can imagine a lot of other anthropologies. There are a lot of them that were only material, that were only radically individual, or that were terribly social. I always think uh, in this context of that movie by Woody Allen, if you haven't seen it, Zelik, where uh, Woody Allen plays a human chameleon. But by that they mean that there's this, there's this man that they've discovered who blends into all social circumstances. They've just discovered him. And he's been in existence for a long time because they have footage of him. In the 1940s, there's a, uh, and of course Woody Allen films this in sepia tone, kind of newsreel type stuff. And you see the Pope on the balcony at St. Peter's greeting, and all of a sudden there's a little tussle over the side. And you look, and there's a Franciscan monk who looks suspiciously like Woody Allen, how he got into that circumstance. There's another one of Hitler <clears throat> raging in one of his speeches. And you, you know, as you're looking at this very familiar footage of Hitler speaking, you look over to the side and there's Woody Allen as one of the SS officers, kind of blending into the scenery. Now we could believe, like Marx, that the essential identity of the person is that we are social, but we don't. We hold these tensions. And this is what perhaps confuses people with Catholic social teaching and why you have a variety of different approaches to the social question from within the perspective of the Catholic tradition. The incarnation of Jesus Christ reiterates all of this, especially the goodness of the material world. If you think about it for a moment, God could have redeemed the world by simply saying a word. The Logos could have justified us all had he wanted to, I suppose. And yet that's not what the Gospel says. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that the redemption of the material world takes place not outside of the world, but from within the midst of the world and through human agency. That is, this eternal God commingles in time and space through the agency of a woman who says yes. So this God is born through the natural process of childbirth to redeem the world. The Savior is born 
That's an amazing concept. Now, as Catholics, it's hard for us to kind of see the uniqueness of that idea because we're so familiar with that idea. But think of other traditions and how they speak about their God. And here we have a God who is flesh, who enters our space so as to bring us back to himself. The incarnation reiterates the creation. And the sacraments that the church establishes extend the, the incarnation. Here's what I mean by that. The sacraments, we were talking at dinner and I gave a little story, uh, which I'll, I'll share with you. The sacraments, we believe, if you know the Baltimore Catechism, what is a sacrament? It's an outward sign instituted by Christ signifying grace, right? So there's this outward sign to every sacrament. There's a physicality. What is it in baptism? It's water. What is it in um, the uh, holy orders? The laying on of hands of the bishop. In the sacrament of penance, it's the priest who in the name of Christ absolves from sin. What is it in marriage? What is it in vows? The vow vows? No. Somebody said the ring? No. One person said to me it was the um, unity candle. And I said, no, the unity candle, I tell all the couples I'm uh, preparing for marriage, the unity candle is an invention of Protestant florists in search of liturgy. <laughs> I don't need that. Not the unity candle. It's the conjugal union of the couple. It's the physical lovemaking of the couple that's the matter of the sacrament of marriage. And in the Eucharist, it is what? Bread and wine. Note not grapes and grain, bread and wine. What's the difference? Bread and wine has undergone human transformation. It has undergone human work. And so here we have a way in which our work enables us to create that which we can make and offer it to God who gives us back in that mysterious exchange that which we could never make. The creation of human hands, we offer this to God. So you see in the way in which the sacraments extend this notion of the goodness of creation and the incarnation, this is why there is a social teaching. Because the church recognizes the importance of human beings being placed in the context of the world with one another and in a context of scarcity which raises the question of how do we use the material world for human betterment. We are related to each other. How do we use the material world? Now the effects of this anthropology throughout history are astounding because what ended up happening, and this again is, has to be very brief, but if you read somebody like uh, Christopher Dawson or you read someone like Thomas uh, Stor Stark, uh, you, you get an idea of how this anthropological vision inspired systems, institutions. The Catholic Church is an institution-building build, institution building entity, right? Institution is important, which means that culture is important to our sensibility as Catholics. Building of monasteries, building of a hierarchy of a church, sending out missionaries. So there's this uh, culture building enterprise that is part and parcel of what the church is. We don't believe the church is just some mystical thing. We think it is an institutional thing that Christ came and founded a hierarchical church. And that this is why all of these tussles over the nature of the church and its hierarchical function are very important, not just for some small group of theologians, but for the whole world because Western civilization would not have been built without this understanding of Christian anthropology, the respect for the material world. And in order to respect the material world, in order to use the material world for the benefit of all mankind, it was necessary to establish certain principles derived from the nature of the case, derived from Christian anthropology, that would better protect human nature. And so we have the institution of private property, the recognition that human beings create things. And because they 
infuse into the material world and take out of the material world by, by virtue of their reason, their intellect, their courage, things from the material world, which we call the creation of wealth. Remember, wealth doesn't exist in a state of nature, right? If wealth existed in a state of nature, then uh, Brazil would be rich and Japan would be poor. That's not the case. Japan has learned how to harness nature and how to transform nature into wealth. What does that mean? It means simply bringing out from nature that which can be used for human service. That's why the entrepreneur really is a servant. I know that not all entrepreneurs see themselves that way. They're just simply mistaken. The best entrepreneur, certainly the Christian entrepreneur, is going to see his or her role as a servant of bringing forth from nature that which has not been utilized before, that which has not been discovered before, fashioning it, packaging it, developing it in such way, manipulating it. What is manipulation? It's the use of your hands. It's kind of like this image of God creating and fashioning the world and presenting it to human beings as something of value to them. That's a proper understanding of what business really is. And the church encouraged this. This is why private property is sacred in our tradition. That's Leo the Thirteenth in the encyclical Rerum Novarum. It's not absolute, but it is sacred because we recognize that it is by the use of our talents and the use of our hands and our ideas and our risk and our investment that we draw from the material world and fashion things of use to others. Well, it's not just private property, but it's contract. Juridical systems, courts, the ability to limit government in recognition of the freedom that human beings legitimately hold. All of these kinds of institutions created the most liberal and prosperous experiment in human liberty in human history, and that's called Western civilization. Now, there's a lot more to be said about that. As I said, those, those writers are, are people you might... Uh, want to look into to see uh, all of the depth of, uh, depths of this. We are inheritors of that. And it was not a mistake. Lord Acton said that liberty is the delicate fruit of a mature civilization. The civilization that we are the inheritors of, the Judeo-Christian civilization, Western civilization, has brought forth this concept of a liberty, not merely the right to do what I want, but the obligation to do what I ought. Because it's the recognition of ourselves as beings of purpose, of intentionality. We are made intentionally, and we have a goal, an end. And if we ignore those ends, those natural laws that are built into the nature of who we are, then we don't flourish, and our cultures don't flourish, and our families don't flourish, and our lives don't flourish. Now, what is Catholic social teaching? This is the more academic part of the lecture. Among the things that the church's teaching is not is that it is not a plan of economic or political policy. I'll reiterate this in a number of ways as I go on, but there's a great deal of confusion on this matter. All too often in the heat of a partisan political debate about which good people may have diff differing opinions and feel very strongly about, efforts are made sometimes in that context to proof text from various documents of the magisterium utilizing the church's teaching to reinforce one or another political policy under debate. And yet I think we need to be very careful here to jump so seamlessly from the magisterium, magisterium's insistence, for example, on the fundamental and non-negotiable moral obligation to the poor, which is part of the irreformable core social doctrine of the church, to jump from that to specifics that are contingent in policy debates, things that are prudential, and form legislation, political legislation, I think is wholly unjustified to jump so seamlessly from the core to the prudential applications of the core. The American bishops in their own pastoral letter in 1986 
wrote Economic Justice for All, wrote the following. Quote, there are also many specific points upon which men and women of goodwill may disagree. We look for a fruitful, a fruitful exchange among differing viewpoints, close quote. Significant in this regard also is the teaching of blessed John the 23rd in his encyclical letter Mater et Magistra, when he said, quote, it, when it comes to reducing these teachings to action, it sometimes happened that even sincere Catholic, Catholic men have differing views. When this occurs, they should take care to have and to show mutual esteem and regard and to explore the content, the, explore the extent to which they can work in cooperating among themselves, close quote. That's 238 in Mater Magistra. And then there is the passage in Pope Benedict's most recent social encyclical, Caritas in Veritate, where he says in number nine, the church does not have technical solutions to offer, close quote. All too often, many Catholic academicians, theologians, priests, even bishops, and supposed advocates of social justice do not appear to understand the distinctions the church herself makes between fundamental non-negotiable dogmas and doctrines and the prudential and deba debatable give and take when it comes to applying these principles of Catholic social teaching to real, the real world. Here one need only consult the compendium of the Catholic Church, of Catholic social teaching, in which we read, the Church's magisterium does not wish to exercise political power or eliminate the freedom of opinion of Catholics regarding contingent questions. Close quote. That's number 571. The specifics of, say, any given year's national budget ought to reflect an accurate and economically well-informed way of proposing how to achieve the worthy goals of, for instance, tending to the vulnerable, creating a sense of prosperity in a society. It is not sufficiently, sufficient to merely state that one, one's goals reflect a preferential option for the poor, especially when the legislation that is conjured up is in reality a dem demonstration of a, a preferential option for the state, for bureaucracy. A common error often assumes that concern for the economically weak and marginalized must somehow translate first into yet another government program. That assumption is wrong, and it flies in the face of another principle of Catholic social teaching, the principle of subsidiarity. With good reason, this is something that those on the Catholic left, or whatever remains of it these days, rarely mention or grapple with because they know that it would raise many questions about the prudence of any number of, for instance, welfare programs that they support. Too often encyclicals, especially social encyclicals, are read as standalone documents and not within the broader sweep and strong, longer tradition of Catholic social teaching, which does not, of course, begin, as I said at the outset, with rerum novarum, but rather goes back to the gospel of Jesus Christ himself. In a real sense, the Church's social doctrine might better be said to be pre-political, in that it seeks to form the varied stances and policies, not of the Church, but of her faithful, in their own political commitments, within their own vocation as lay people active in the world, and within the sphere of their own particular capacities. And it might likewise be said to transcend politics, because unlike politics, whose goal is to develop prudential policy prescriptions, the church's telos, the church's end, the church's ultimate goal in her social doctrine is nothing short of human redemption itself. It is true that various social encyclicals have come closer to underscoring the validity of one or more particular policy positions than others. That is partly the reflection of the times in which they are written, partly a reflection of the fact that certain teachings of the church, such as the absolute condemnation of particular acts, I give you abortion, or its conviction that any a given political system such as communism is by its very nature and cannot by its very nature help but violate 
human dignity. These translate more clearly and more directly into specific policy positions. No Catholic, for, existent, for uh, example, can be a communist. Because to be a communist, in the true sense of the word, is to be a materialist. And no Catholic can support laws that promote contra-life policies. But aside from these kinds of issues where there is a direct intrinsic evil to the act, uh, and these are relatively few in number, Catholics can enjoy an enormous scope of prudential judgment when it comes to their actions in the sphere of politics, economics, and society. No Catholic can intentionally ever choose to do evil. But when it comes to doing good, Catholics enjoy an enormous latitude. The Church's teaching in the moral realm, of which her social teaching is merely one aspect, is one consistent body of thought. It is not a hodgepodge of policy concerns among which Catholics can pick and choose along the lines of the fashionable uh, Catholic uh, ca cafeteria ca Catholicism. The Church's solicitude for the poor, the marginalized, the unborn, the elderly are all of a piece. A Catholic cannot subordinate justice issues to life issues. He must embrace the Church's teaching as a whole simply because life issues are justice issues. Yet the distinction holds. This is not because social justice or justice issues are less important than life issues, but because they are fundamentally different. A difference rooted in two millennia of Catholic moral reflection. Abortion involves the direct and intentional destruction of an innocent human life. It is never permiss uh, permissible intentionally to choose that evil. Laws that permit abortion are thus inherently unjust, and Catholics are obligated to work toward the legal prohibition of abortion. When it comes, however, to doing good, which is what addressing poverty entails, the Church does not stipulate exactly how such good is to be accomplished. Helping the poor requires a different sort of moral analysis, not because I am or because the Church is dualistic or schizophrenic, as some critics might suggest, nor because assisting the poor is less important than protecting the unborn, but because the two issues possess different characteristics and therefore require different sorts of moral analysis. This distinction holds, for example, outside the realm of the Church's social teaching and can be seen in her teaching on the moral manner in which life itself is conceived. A superficial criticism of the Church's stance, for instance, against artificial contraception says, why is it wrong to avoid contraception by the use of chemicals or condoms, but not immoral when using natural family planning methods? Think about that. The error in this argument is the same one made by the critics to whom I'm responding. In the former case, an evil means is being chosen, the action to chemically prevent conception, for example, rather than refraining from doing a good at a particular time, that is, the actions leading to conception. It is not a sin to refrain from choosing from all of the many goods that are available at a given time. It is always a sin to intentionally choose to do evil. To my mind, Pope Benedict XVI is perhaps the Pope who, since the beginning of modern Catholic social teaching, has most been ex most explicit about this point. When we look, for instance, <clears throat> at caritas in veritate, there are many suggestions offered about the good we can do. But the Pope is very careful uh, not to frame any of them in terms that suggest that every Catholic must wholeheartedly embrace them. For a Pope is so, who is so often caricatured by those within the Church and outside of the Church alike for being authoritarian, isn't it strange how respectful Pope Benedict is of the legitimate freedom enjoyed by lay Catholics when they do good. At the outset of Caritas in Veritate, uh, 
as I said at the beginning, I quoted this at the beginning, the Pope says the Church does not have technical solutions to offer and does not claim to interfere in any way in the policy of states. Number nine. None of this is to say that the Church is guilty of Karl Marx's accusation, namely that it acts as a kind of an anesthetist to lull people into a malaise as to their social deprivation, their social condition, thus impeding what for him was an innate revolutionary impulse in the hearts of all workers. This is not what the Church is about. Rather, by her very constitution, rooted in the incarnation of the Son of God, the Church seeks to point to the things that truly matter from the standpoint of man's salvation. And here I would argue we discover a key to understanding Benedict XVI's approach to social, political, and economic issues in Caritas and Veritate. But also we find it in Deus Caritas Est and Spe Salvi, his two previous encyclicals. His emphasis in all three of these encyclicals has been on deepening the theological dimension of the Church's social teaching, not only by focusing upon the scriptural dimension, but also the writings of the Church Fathers, preeminently St. Augustine, as well as some of the giants of, 19th, of 20th century Catholicism, such as the late Cardinal Henri de Lubac. What does the truth of Christian love tell us, for example, about how we treat our brothers and sisters in need? It tells us that we recognize poverty as more than simply a material phenomenon. Man is a moral and a spiritual being as well as a physical being, as I said at the outset, and thus also at risk of moral and spiritual poverty. The same attention to love tells us that because man is made free, it is a mistake to undermine and suffocate his freedom in the name of love. It is not an act of solidarity to try and take over the lives of those in need, even if we think it is for their betterment. The approach of the church as the Second Vatican Council teaches us, is not to impose the truth upon society, but to propose it to society. A true act of solidarity is to assist the person in need to the extent that they need such help, so as to avoid reducing them to a state of dependency. This is an especially powerful theme in Deus Caritas Est, and is echoed many times in Caritatis in Veritate. Likewise, the Christian conception of hope, so profoundly studied in Spe Salvi, but also mentioned many times in Caritas in Veritate, is a counsel against both utopianism and despair. Both mindsets are perpetual temptations for Catholics working in the world, and both reflect a diminishment of faith and the power of God. To be utopian is to assume that we can build a world in which the effects of human fallibility are abolished, which is, of course, impossible. But to despair is to give up on the redemptive power of the Lord working in and through history, precisely through the choices and actions of human beings to transform the world so that it comes closer to the transforming vision that we find in the Gospels. By bringing these and other Christian Christian theological themes to bear upon the social dilemmas that confront people in their daily lives, Benedict is reminding us of what truly makes the Catholic approach distinctive. Yes, it is true that the natural law tradition continues to exert a profound influence upon Catholic social teaching. That is the contribution of natural reason. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. In that sense, Caritas in Veritate and Benedict XVI's other encyclicals are very consistent with the theological project of Joseph Ratzinger, which is to renew the church by going back to the sources of Christian revelation. In conclusion, in the period after the Second Vatican Council, there was perhaps too much deference to what the world, quote unquote, had to say about any number of political, economic, and social questions. And the Church has, of course, always affirmed the truth 
that is discovered and knowable by natural and social sciences. But in the end, all these things and their ultimate significance can only be fully grasped with regard to that which comes through Christian revelation. That, I would argue, is the key to grasping the theological dimensions of Catholic social teaching 